gifts of healings and miracles. God has given us much in these last days, and where much is given much will be required. The Lord has said to us, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out, and to be trodden under foot of men. We see a thought on the same line when our Lord Jesus says, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. On the other hand he tells us, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. If we do not move on with the Lord these days, and do not walk in the light of revealed truth, we shall become as the savourless salt, as a withered branch. This one thing we must do, forgetting those things that are behind, the past failures and the past blessings, we must reach forth for those things which are before, and press toward the mark for the prize of our high calling of God in Christ Jesus. For many years the Lord has been moving me on and keeping me from spiritual stagnation. When I was in the Wesleyan Methodist Church I was sure I was saved and was sure I was alright. The Lord said to me, come out, and I came out. When I was with the people known as the brethren I was sure I was all right now. But the Lord said, come out. Then I went into the Salvation Army. At that time it was full of life and there were revivals everywhere. But the Salvation Army went into natural things and the great revivals that they had in those early days ceased. The Lord said to me, come out, and I came out. I have had to come out three times since. I believe that this Pentecostal revival that we are now in is the best thing that the Lord is on the earth today, and yet I believe that God has something out of this that is going to be still better. God has no use for any man who is not hungering and thirsting for yet more of himself and his righteousness. The Lord has told us to covet earnestly the best gifts, and we need to be covetous for those that will bring him most glory. We need to see the gifts of healing and the working of miracles in operation today. Some say that it is necessary for us to have the gift of discernment in operation with the gifts of healing, but even apart from this gift I believe the Holy Ghost will have a divine revelation for us as we deal with the sick. Most people seem to have discernment, or think they have, and if they would turn it on themselves for twelve months they would never want to discern again. The gift of discernment is not criticism. I am satisfied that in Pentecostal circles today that our paramount need is more perfect love. Perfect love will never want the preeminence in everything, it will never want to take the place of another, it will always be willing to take the back seat. If you go to a convention there is always someone who wants to give a message, who wants to be heard. If you have a desire to go to a convention you should have three things settled in your mind. Do I want to be heard? Do I want to be seen? Do I want anything on the line of finances? If I have these things in my heart I have no right to be there. The one thing that must move us must be the constraining love of God to minister for him. A preacher always loses out when he gets his mind on finances. It is well for Pentecostal preachers to avoid making much of finances except to stir up people to help our missionaries on financial lines. A preacher who gets big collections for the missionaries need never fear, the Lord will take care of his finances. A preacher should not land at a place and say that God had sent him. I am always fearful when I hear a man advertising this. If he is sent of God, the saints will know it. God has his plans for his servants and we must so live in his plans that he will place us where he wants us. If you seek nothing but the will of God, he will always put you in the right place at the right time. I want you to see that the gifts of healing and the working of miracles are part of the Spirit's plan and will come forth in operation as we are working along that plan. I must know the movement of the Spirit and the voice of God. I must understand the will of God if I am to see the gifts of the Spirit in operation. The gifts of healing are so varied. You may go and see ten people and every case is different. I am never happier in the Lord than when I am in a bedroom with a sick person. 
I have had more revelations of the Lord's presence when I have ministered to the sick at their bedsides than at any other time. It is as your heart goes out to the needy ones in deep compassion that the Lord manifests his presence. You are able to locate their position. It is then that you know that you must be filled with the Spirit to deal with the conditions before you. Where people are in sickness you find frequently that they are dense about scripture. They usually know three scriptures though. They know about Paul's thorn in the flesh, and that Paul told Timothy to take a little wine for his stomach's sake, and that Paul left someone sick somewhere. They forget his name, and don't remember the name of the place, and don't know where the chapter is. Most people think they have a thorn in the flesh. The chief thing in dealing with a person who is sick is to locate that exact position. As you are ministering under the Spirit's power the Lord will let you see just that which will be more helpful and most faith-inspiring to them. When I was in the plumbing business I enjoyed praying for the sick. Urgent calls would come and I would have no time to wash, and with my hands all black I would preach to these sick ones, my heart all aglow with love. Ah, you must have your heart in the thing when you pray for the sick. You have to get right to the bottom of the cancer with a divine compassion and then you will see the gifts of the Spirit in operation. I was called at 10 o'clock one night to pray for a young person given up by the doctor who was dying of consumption. As I looked, I saw that unless God undertook it was impossible for her to live. I turned to the mother and said, Well, mother. You will have to go to bed. She said, Oh. I have not had my clothes off for three weeks. I said to the daughters, you will have to go to bed, but they did not want to go. It was the same with the son. I put on my overcoat and said, goodbye, I'm off. They said, oh, don't leave us. I said, I can do nothing here. They said, oh, if you will stop, we will all go to bed. I knew that God would move nothing in an atmosphere of mere natural sympathy and unbelief. They all went to bed and I stayed, and that was surely a time as I knelt by that bed face to face with death and with the devil. But God can change the hardest situation and make you know that he is almighty. Then the fight came. It seemed as though the heavens were brass. I prayed from 11 to 3.30 in the morning. I saw the glimmering light on the face of the sufferer and saw her pass away. The devil said, now you are done for. You have come from Bradford and the girl has died on your hands. I said, it can't be. God did not send me here for nothing. This is a time to change strength. I remembered that passage which said, men ought always to pray and not to faint. Death had taken place but I knew that my God was all powerful and he that had split the Red Sea is just the same today. It was a time when I would not have, no, and God said, yes. I looked at the window and at that moment the face of Jesus appeared. It seemed as though a million rays of light were coming from his face. As he looked at the one who had just passed away, the color came back to the face. She rolled over and fell asleep. Then I had a glorious time. In the morning she woke early put on a dressing gown and walked to the piano. She started to play and to sing a wonderful song. The mother and the sister and the brother had all come down to listen. The Lord had undertaken. A miracle had been wrought. The Lord is calling us along this way. I am thanking God for difficult cases. The Lord has called us into heart union with himself. He wants his bride to have one heart and one spirit with him and to do what he himself loved to do. That case had to be a miracle. The lungs were gone, they were just in shreds, but the Lord restored lungs that were perfectly sound. There is a fruit of the Spirit that must accompany the gift of healing and that is long suffering. The man who is going through with God to be used in healing must be a man of long suffering. He must be always ready with a word of comfort. If the sick one is in distress and helpless and does not see everything eye to eye with you, you must bear with him. Our Lord Jesus Christ was filled with compassion and lived and moved in a place of long suffering, and we will have to get into this place if we are to help needy ones. There are some times when you pray for the sick and you are apparently rough. But you are not dealing with the person, 
you are dealing with the satanic forces that are binding the person. Your heart is full of love and compassion to all, but you are moved to a holy anger as you see the place the devil has taken in the body of the sick one, and you deal with his position with a real forcefulness. One day a pet dog followed a lady out of her house and ran all round her feet. She said to the dog, My dear, I cannot have you with me today. The dog wagged its tail and made a big fuss. She said, Go home, my dear. But the dog did not go. At last she shouted roughly, Go home, and off it went. Some people deal with the devil like that, the devil can stand all the comfort you like to give him. Cast him out. You are dealing not with the person, you are dealing with the devil. Demon power must be dislodged in the name of the Lord. You are always right when you dare to deal with sickness as with the devil. Much sickness is caused by some misconduct, there is something wrong, there is some neglect somewhere, and Satan has had a chance to get in. It is necessary to repent and confess where you have given place to the devil, and then he can be dealt with. When you deal with a cancer case, recognize that it is a living evil spirit that is destroying the body. I had to pray for a woman in Los Angeles one time who was suffering with cancer, and as soon as it was cursed it stopped bleeding. It was dead. The next thing that happened was that the natural body pressed it out, because the natural body had no room for dead matter. It came out like a great big ball with tens of thousands of fibers. All these fibers had been pressing into the flesh. These evil powers move to get further hold of the system, but the moment they are destroyed their hold is gone. Jesus said to his disciples that he gave them power to loose and power to bind. It is our privilege in the power of the Holy Ghost to loose the prisoners of Satan and to let the oppressed go free. Take your position in the first epistle of John and declare, Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Then recognize that it is not yourself that has to deal with the power of the devil, but the greater one that is in you. Oh, what it means to be filled with him. You can do nothing of yourself, but he that is in you will win the victory. Your being has become the temple of the spirit. Your mouth, your mind, your whole being becomes exercised and worked upon by the spirit of God. I was called to a certain town in Norway. The hall seated about 1500 people. When I got to the place it was packed, and hundreds were trying to get in. There were some policemen there. The first thing I did was to preach to the people outside the building. Then I said to the policemen, it hurts me very much that there are more people outside than inside and I feel I must preach to the people. I would like you to get me the marketplace to preach in. They secured for me a great park and a big stand was erected and I was able to preach to thousands. After the preaching we had some wonderful cases of healing. One man came a hundred miles bringing his food with him. He had not been passing anything through his stomach for over a month as he had a great cancer on his stomach. He was healed at that meeting, and opening his parcel, he began eating before all the people. There was a young woman there with a stiff hand. Instead of the mother making the child use her arm she had allowed the child to keep the arm dormant until it was stiff, and she had grown up to be a young woman and was like the woman that was bowed down with the spirit of infirmity. As she stood before me I cursed the spirit of infirmity in the name of Jesus. It was instantly cast out and the arm was free. Then she waved it all over. At the close of the meeting the devil laid out two people with fits. When the devil is manifesting himself, then is the time to deal with him. Both of these people were delivered, and when they stood up and thanked and praised the Lord what a wonderful time we had. We need to wake up and be on the stretch to believe God. Before God could bring me to this place he has broken me a thousand times. I have wept, I have groaned, I have travailed many a night until God broke me. It seems to me that until God has mowed you down you never can have this long suffering for others. We can never have the gifts of healing and the working of miracles in operation only as we stand in the divine power that God gives us and we stand believing God, and having done all we still stand believing. We have been seeing wonderful miracles these last days and they are only a little of what we are going to see.
I believe that we are right on the threshold of wonderful things, but I want to emphasize that all these things will be through the power of the Holy Ghost. You must not think that these gifts will fall upon you like ripe cherries. There is a sense in which you have to pay the price for everything you get. We must be covetous for God's best gifts, and see amen to any preparation the Lord takes us through, in order that we may be humble usable vessels through whom he himself can operate by means of the Spirit's power. Now what about divine health for the individual? The Lord Jesus came to bring back to us what was forfeited in the garden. Adam and Eve were there free from sin and disease and first sin came, then disease, and then death came after, and people want to say it is not so. But I tell you, get the devil out of you, and you will have a different body. Get disease out and you will get the devil out. Jesus rebuked sickness, and it went, and so I want to bring you to a place where you will see that you are healed. You must give God your life. You must see that sickness has to go and God has to come in. That your lives have to be clean, and God will keep you holy. That you have to walk before God, and he will make you perfect, for God says, without holiness no man shall see him, and as we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. I want to say to you believers that there is a very blessed place for you to attain to, and the place where God wants you is a place of victory. When the Spirit of the Lord comes into your life it must be victory. The disciples, before they received the Holy Ghost, were always in bondage. Jesus said to them one day, just before the crucifixion, one of you shall betray me, and they were so conscious of their inability and their human depravity and helplessness that they said one to another, Is it I? And then Peter was ashamed that he had taken that stand, and he rose up and said, Though all men deny thee, yet will not I. And likewise the others rose and declared that neither would they. But they everyone did leave him. But, beloved, after they received the power of the endowment of the Holy Ghost upon them, if you remember, they were made like lions to meet any difficulty. They were made to stand any test, and these men that failed before the crucifixion, when the power of God fell upon them in the upper room, they came out in front of all those people who were gathered together and accused them of crucifying the Lord of glory. They were bold. What had made them so? I will tell you. Purity is bold. Take, for instance, a little child. It will gaze straight into your eyes for as long as you like, without winking once. The more pure, the more bold. And I tell you God wants to bring us into that divine purity of heart and life that holy boldness. Not officiousness. Not swelled-headedness. Not self-righteousness. But a pure, holy, divine appointment by one who will come in and live with you, defying the powers of Satan and standing you in a place of victory overcoming the world. You never inherited that from the flesh. That is a gift of God, by the Spirit, to all who obey. And so, none can say they wish they were overcomers, but that they have failed and failed until they have no hope. Brother, God can make you an overcomer. When the Spirit of God comes into your body He will transform you, He will quicken you. Oh, there is a life in the spirit which makes you free from the law of sin and death, and there is an audacity about it also there is a personality about it. It is the personality of the deity. It is God in you. I tell you that God is able to so transform and change and bring you into order by the spirit that you can become a new creation after God's order. There is no such thing as defeat for the believer. Without the cross, without Christ's righteousness, Without the new birth, without the indwelling Christ, without this divine incoming of God, I see myself a failure. But God, the Holy Ghost, can come in and take our place till we are renewed and righteousness made the children of God. Nay, verily, the sons of God. Do you think that God would make you to be a failure? God has never made man to be a failure. He made man to be a son. To walk about the earth in power, and so when I look at you I know that there is a capability that can be put into you which is the capacity of controlling and bringing everything into subjection. Yes, 
there is the capacity of the power of Christ to dwell in you, to bring every evil thing unto you till you can put your feet upon it, and be master over the flesh and the devil, till within you there is nothing rises except that which will magnify and glorify the Lord. And God wants me to show you these disciples, who were so frail, like you and me, that we, too, may now be filled with God, and become pioneers of this wonderful truth I am preaching. Here we see Peter, frail, helpless, and, at every turn of the tide, a failure. And God filled that man with the spirit of his righteousness, till he went up and down, bold as a lion, and when he came to death even crucifixion he counted himself unworthy of being crucified like his Lord, and asked that his murderers would put him head downwards on the tree. There was a deep submissiveness, and a power that was greater than all flesh. Peter had changed into the power of God. The scriptures do not tell two stories. They tell the truth. I want you to know the truth, and the truth will set you free. What is truth? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He that believeth on me, as the scriptures have said, out of his innermost being shall flow forth rivers of living water. This he spake of the Spirit that should be given them after Jesus was glorified. I do not find anything in the Bible but holiness, and nothing in the world but worldliness. Therefore if I live in the world I shall become worldly. But, on the other hand, if I live in the Bible, I shall become holy. This is the truth, and the truth will set you free. The power of God can remodel you. He can make you hate sin and love righteousness. He can take away bitterness and hatred and covetousness and malice, and can so consecrate you by his power, through his blood, that you are made pure every bit holy. Pure in mind, heart and actions pure, right through. God has given me the way of life, and I want to give it to you, as though this were the last day I had to live. Jesus is the best there is for you, and you can each take him away with you. God gave his son to be the propitiation for your sins, and not only so, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus came to make us free from sin free from disease and pain. When I see any who are diseased and in pain, I have great compassion for them, and when I lay my hands upon them, I know God means men to be so filled with him that the power of sin shall have no effect upon them, and they shall go forth, as I am doing, to help the needy, sick, and afflicted. But what is the main thing? To preach the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Jesus came to do this. John came preaching repentance. The disciples began by preaching repentance towards God, and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I tell you, beloved, if you have really been changed by God, there is a repentance in your heart never to be repented of. Through the revelation of the word of God we find that divine healing is solely for the glory of God, and salvation is to make you to know that now you have to be inhabited by another, even God, and you have to walk with God in newness of life. Preaching deliverance to the captives. Our precious Lord Jesus has everything for everybody. Forgiveness of sin, healing of diseases and the fullness of the Spirit all come from once or see from the Lord Jesus Christ. Hear him who is the same yesterday, today and forever as he announces the purpose for which he came, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he bath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he bath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus had been baptized by John in Jordan and the Holy Spirit had descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. Being full of the Holy Ghost. He had been led by the Spirit into the wilderness, there to come off more than conqueror over the arch enemy. Then he returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee and preached in the synagogues, and at last he came to his old hometown Nazareth, where he announced his mission in the words I have just quoted. For a brief while he ministered on the earth and then gave his life a ransom for all. But God raised him from the dead. And before he went to the glory he told his disciples that they too should receive the power of the Holy Ghost upon them. Thus, through them, his gracious ministry would continue.
This power of the Holy Ghost was not only for a few apostles, but even for them that are afar off. Even as many as our God should call Acts 2.39 even for us in this 20th century. Some ask, but was not this power just for the privileged few in the first century? No. Read the Master's Great Commission as recorded by Mark, and you will see it is for them that believe. After I had received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and I know that I received, for the Lord gave me the Spirit in just the same way as he gave him to the disciples at Jerusalem, I sought the mind of the Lord as to why I was baptized. One day I came home from work and went into the house and my wife asked me, which way did you come in? I told her that I had come in at the back door. She said, there is a woman upstairs and she has brought an old man of eighty to be prayed for. He is raving up there and the great crowd is outside the front door, ringing the doorbell and wanting to know what is going on in the house. The Lord quietly whispered, this is what I baptized you for. I carefully opened the door of the room where the man was, desiring to be obedient to what my Lord would say to me. The man was crying and shouting in distress, I am lost. I am lost. I have committed the unpardonable sin. I am lost. I am lost. My wife said, Dad, what shall we do? The Spirit of the Lord moved me to cry out, Come out, thou lying spirit. In a moment the evil spirit went, and the man was free. Deliverance to the captives. And the Lord said to me, This is what I baptized you for. There is a place where God, through the power of the Holy Ghost, reigns supreme in our lives. The Spirit reveals, unfolds, takes of the things of Christ and shows them to us, and prepares us to be more than a match for satanic forces. When Nicodemus came to Jesus he said, We know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou dost, except God be with him. Jesus said to him, Verily, Verily I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was impressed by the miracles wrought. And Jesus pointed out the necessity of a miracle being wrought with every man who would see the kingdom. When a man is born of God, is brought from darkness to light, a mighty miracle is wrought. Jesus saw every touch by God as a miracle, and so we may expect to see miracles wrought today. It is wonderful to have the Spirit of the Lord upon us. I would rather have the Spirit of God on me for five minutes than to receive a million dollars. Do you see how Jesus mastered the devil in the wilderness? He knew he was the Son of God and Satan came along with an if. How many times has Satan come along to you this way? He says, after all, you may be deceived. You know you really are not a child of God. If the devil comes along and says that you are not saved, it is a pretty sure sign that you are. When he comes and tells you that you are not healed, it may be taken as good evidence that the Lord has sent his word and healed you. The devil knows that if he can capture your thought life, he has won a mighty victory over you. His great business is injecting thoughts, but if you are pure and holy you will instantly shrink from them. God wants us to let the mind that was in Christ Jesus, the pure, holy, humble mind of Christ, be in us. I come across people everywhere I go who are held bound by deceptive conditions, and these conditions have come about simply because they have allowed the devil to make their minds the place of his stronghold. How are we to guard against this? The Lord has provided us with weapons that are mighty through God to the pulling down of these strongholds of the enemy, and by means of which every thought shall be brought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ and his mighty name are an antidote to all the subtle seeds of unbelief that Satan would sow in your minds. In the first chapter of Acts, we see that Jesus gave commandment to the disciples that they should wait for the promise of the Father and he told them that not many days hence they would be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Luke tells us that he had written his former treatise concerning all that Jesus began both to do and teach. The ministry of Christ did not end at the cross, but the Acts and the Epistles give us accounts of what he continued to do and teach through those whom he indwelt. 
and our blessed Lord Jesus is still alive, and continues his ministry through those who are filled with his spirit. He is still healing the broken hearted and delivering the captives through those on whom he places his spirit. I was traveling one day in a railway train in Sweden. At one station there boarded the train an old lady with her daughter. The old lady's expression was so troubled that I inquired what was the matter with her. I heard that she was going to the hospital to have her leg taken off. She began to weep as she told that the doctors had said there was no hope for her except through having her leg amputated. She was seventy years old. I said to my interpreter, tell her that Jesus can heal her. The instant this was said to her, it was as though a veil was taken off her face, it became so light. We stopped at another station and the carriage filled tip with people. There was a rush of men to board the train and the devil said, you're done. But I knew I had the best proposition, for hard things are always opportunities to get to the Lord more glory when he manifests his power. Every trial is a blessing. There have been times when I have been pressed through circumstances and it seemed as if a dozen road engines were going over me, but I have found that the hardest things are just lifting places into the grace of God. We have such a lovely Jesus. He always proves himself to be such a mighty deliverer. He never fails to plan the best things for us. The train began moving and I crouched down, and in the name of Jesus commanded the disease to leave. The old lady cried, I'm healed. I know I'm healed. She stamped her leg and said, I'm going to prove it. So when we stopped at another station she marched up and down, and shouted, I'm not going to the hospital. Once again our wonderful Jesus had proven himself a healer of the broken hearted, a deliverer of one that was bound. At one time I was so bound that no human power could help me. My wife was looking for me to pass away. There was no help. At that time I had just had a faint glimpse of Jesus as the healer. For six months I had been suffering from appendicitis, occasionally getting temporary relief. I went to the mission of which I was pastor, but I was brought to the floor in awful agony, and they brought me home to my bed. All night I was praying, pleading for deliverance, but none came. My wife was sure it was my home call and sent for a physician. He said that there was no possible chance for me my body was too weak. Having had the appendicitis for six months, my whole system was drained, and, because of that, he thought that it was too late for an operation. He left my wife in a state of broken heartedness. After he left, there came to our door a young man and an old lady. I knew that she was a woman of real prayer. They came upstairs to my room. This young man jumped on the bed and commanded the evil spirit to come out of me. He shouted, Come out, you devil! I command you to come out in the name of Jesus. There was no chance for an argument, or for me to tell him that I would never believe that there was a devil inside of me. The thing had to go in the name of Jesus, and it went, and I was instantly healed. I aroused and dressed and went downstairs. I was still in the plumbing business and I asked my wife, is there any work in? I am all right now, and I am going to work. I found there was a certain job to be done and I picked up my tools and went off to do it. Just after I left, the doctor came in, put his plug hat down in a hall, and walked up to the bedroom. But the invalid was not there. Where is Mr. Wigglesworth? He asked. Oh, doctor, he's gone out to work, said my wife. You'll never see him alive again, said the doctor. They'll bring him back a corpse. Well, I'm the corpse. Since that time, in many parts of the world, the Lord has given me the privilege of praying for people with appendicitis. And I have seen a great many people up and dressed within a quarter of an hour from the time I prayed for them. We have a living Christ who is willing to meet people on every line. A number of years ago I met brother D.W. Kerr and he gave me a letter of introduction to a brother in Zion City named Cook. I took his letter to brother Cook, and he said, God has sent you here. He gave me the addresses of six people and asked me to go and pray for them and meet him again at twelve o'clock.
I got back at about 12.30 and he told me about a young man who was to be married the following Monday. His sweetheart was in Zion City dying of appendicitis. I went to the house and found that the physician had just been there and had pronounced that there was no hope. The mother was nearly distracted and was pulling her hair, and saying, Is there no deliverance? I said to her, Woman, believe God and your daughter will be healed and be up and dressed in fifteen minutes. But the mother went on screaming. They took me into the bedroom, and I prayed for the girl and commanded the evil spirit to depart in the name of Jesus. She cried, I am healed. I said to her, Do you want me to believe that you are healed? If you are healed, get up. She said, You get out of the room, and I'll get up. In less than ten minutes the doctor came in. He wanted to know what had happened. She said, a man came in and prayed for me, and I'm healed. The doctor pressed his finger right in the place that had been so sore, and the girl neither moaned nor cried. He said, this is God. It made no difference whether he acknowledged it or not, I knew that God had worked. Our God is real in saving and healing power today. Our Jesus is just the same, yesterday, and today, and forever. He saves and heals today just as of old and he wants to be your savior and your healer. Oh, if you would only believe God. What would happen? The greatest things. Some have never tasted the grace of God, have never heard the peace of God. Unbelief robs them of these blessings. It is possible to hear and yet not conceive the truth. It is possible to read the word and not share in the life it brings. It is necessary for us to have the Holy Ghost to unfold the Word and bring to us the life that is Christ. We can never fully understand the wonders of this redemption until we are full of the Holy Ghost. I was once at an afternoon meeting. The Lord had been graciously with us and many had been healed by the power of God. Most of the people had gone home and I was left alone, when I saw a young man who was evidently hanging back to have a word. I asked, what do you want? He said, I wonder if I could ask you to pray for me. I said, what's the trouble? He said, can't you smell? The young fellow had gone into sin and was suffering the consequences. He said, I have been turned out of two hospitals. I am broken out all over. I have abscesses all over me. And I could see that he had a bad breaking out at the nose. He said, I heard you preach and could not understand about this healing business, and was wondering if there was any hope for me. I said to him, Do you know Jesus? He did not know the first thing about salvation, but I said to him, Stand still. I placed my hands on his head and then on his loins and cursed that terrible disease in the name of Jesus. He cried out, I know I'm healed. I can feel a warmth and a glow all over me. I said, Who did it? He said, your prayers. I said, no, it was Jesus. He said, was it he? Oh, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, save me. And that young man went away healed and saved. Oh, what a merciful God we have. What a wonderful Jesus is ours. Are you oppressed? Cry out to God. It is always good for people to cry out. You may have to cry out. The Holy Ghost and the Word of God will bring to light every hidden, unclean thing that must be revealed. There is always a place of deliverance when you let God search out that which is spoiling and marring your life. That evil spirit that was in the man in the synagogue cried out, Let us alone. It was a singular thing that the evil spirit had never cried out like that until Jesus walked into the place where he was. Jesus rebuked the thing, saying, hold thy peace and come out of him, and the man was delivered. He is just the same Jesus, exposing the powers of evil, delivering the captives and letting the oppressed go free, purifying them and cleansing their hearts. Those evil spirits that inhabited the man who had the legion did not want to be sent to the pit to be tormented before their time, and so they cried out to be sent into the swine. Hell is such an awful place that even the demons hate the thought of going there. How much more should men seek to be saved from the pit? God is compassionate and says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. And he has further stated, 
whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Seek him now, call on his name right now, and there is forgiveness, healing, redemption, deliverance, and everything you need for you right here and now, and that which will satisfy you throughout eternity. Blessings in Australia Sister Winnie Andrews, N. Melbourne, Australia, writes, Our brother Wigglesworth landed here February the 16th, and at a meeting that very night. The dear Lord was present and fit to heal. A little girl of six, having never walked, after she had been prayed for, walked out of the front door with her mother, who was full of joy for what the Lord had done for her little one. Another man who had been suffering with bad feet for years and walked only with the aid of a stick was instantly healed and has been along several times to testify to what the Lord has done for him. Many deaf people have been delivered in answer to the prayer of faith. One night a dear man and his wife whom he brought to the meeting in a wheelchair, were both healed. He had been suffering from deafness for twenty years and she had not walked for over six why two years. After prayer she got out of her chair and walked to the station, with her husband pushing the empty chair. He, too, was rejoicing in that he was now able to hear perfectly. Oh what a wonderful God we have! Blessed be his holy name! At the Sunday afternoon service, a dear young woman who had been suffering with tuberculosis for thirteen years and who was in the last stages, came leaning on the arm of a friend and was prayed for. At once she received new life and was perfectly delivered. The terrible burning sores which were eating their way into her bones have dried up and are peeling off, and she is looking so well and happy and is as strong as can be. Glory to God! Last night a young man suffering from consumption was prayed for and was instantly made whole. Oh, our hearts overflow at the glorious things God is doing in our midst. Many have been healed of neuritis, heart and lung trouble and stiff joints. One woman who had not walked for 22 years and could not as much as turn her head after prayer got out of bed and walked, praise God. Pentecostal Evangel